Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, actually through 20, and he listed six different pieces of equipment. He didn't name the seventh piece of equipment by name as far as a soldier's equipment. He didn't name it. But it has to be there. It has to be there. It's that lance. Now these lances that the Romans discovered and developed were very, very special lances. They were, they were not just javelins. They were not just ordinary spears. They were wooden and they were metal. Now, you can't tell it real well, but say, look at this one right here. All this is wood. But starting right there, it becomes a metal rod. And on the tip of it is a three-pointed tip, the arrow tip. It is case-hardened, case-hardened to be extremely hard to go through metal. Now, you see the shiny part on the soldier's uh, shoulders? Those are metal strips, like metal armor. And they're just small strips, and they, they fold in with each other so that the Roman soldier, this is all metal strips. All this is metal. And of course, he had a skirt, and we'll get onto the shoes. Now, each one of these parts of this armor is very, very special. It has a spiritual uh, corollary to something that we have to have going on in our life in order to stand against the wiles of the devil and to defeat the devil. Um, what, what were the Roman soldier's shoes made of? What were they? Leather. Leather. Some of you ladies have on some now. Sandals. sandals. Well, guess what? Most of your artists draw these as sandals on the Roman soldier's feet. They were not sandals. I found out that some of these sandals that's on these Roman soldiers' feet, they had metal studs on the bottom of them, and they had one-inch spikes. One-inch needle spikes on the bottom. And in some cases, I don't know where the cases were, there were certain circumstances for whatever the battle was going to be, I guess it was because of the terrain and the kind of soil, some of their, their shoes, by the way, the shoes were metal. They were not sandals with a bunch of straps like some of you ladies would wear today. Because if an sol enemy soldier could cut the toes off of the foot of the soldier, he could almost take him completely out of the battle. So the shoes were metal protection. And in some cases, I don't know, I could not find exactly the case where they would do it. In some cases, the spikes on the bottom of the soles of those metal shoes that they wore were three inches long. The Roman soldier was equipped to destroy. Anything he encountered, he could kill with his feet and shoes. The, the lance, the special thing about the lance was the long metal shaft here before it gets to the point, the tip is case-hardened metal. But they did not case harden this long rod right here. In some of the places you can see better, it's a wooden rod with this metal sticking out the end of it like this. This part here was soft metal on purpose. See, you ever seen the war movies where somebody throws a hand grenade and what does the guy do when the hand grenade falls at his feet? What does he do? He scoops it up and throws it back. Well, in the, in the war and the battle with the Roman soldiers, they knew that the enemy would pick up that lance if it didn't hit a, another soldier. They would pick it up and throw it back. And so they designed their lances in such a way that once it had hit something, the end of it, the rod of it, just bent and turned right over. So that it was no longer effective to come back against their own soldiers. Yet the tip was case hardened so it would go right through metal. Very, very good strategy. They were the most effective army on earth. 
And all the little things that we think about when we read Ephesians chapter 6, oh, put on the whole armor of God. Ladies and gentlemen, when you've got on the whole armor of God, you will destroy the works of the devil. Amen. When you operate under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not only are we to have the armor on, we must also know how to use our weapons. These are spiritual things that we must learn how to use in order to defeat the devil. Some Christians are running around in the battle naked as jaybirds. The only thing they got on is the helmet of salvation. They're saved. Now, I thought about this, and I, I thought about putting a picture of a World War II soldier. When our World War II soldiers went to battle, they had, they had real good boots, Brogan shoes, real good shoes. And they had an iron pot steel helmet on their head. But as far as any other protective armor, they had none. They had none. If you compare a World War II soldier with one of our soldiers today, our soldiers are armored from head to toe. Right. They have got ceramic plates. They, they got uh, bullet, supposedly bulletproof vests, but those bullets on a high-powered rifle, those, those vests won't stop a high-powered rifle bullet. So what do they have in place of that? They have ceramic plates right here in a pocket that protects their chest area. I've seen a picture of one of the soldiers being shot with a ceram uh, when he had on the uh, ceramic plate and he was interviewed afterward. It knocked him, knocked him out, knocked him down. He looked like he was dead. He said, the thing that saved my life because he got shot right there with an AK-47. And it, it knocked him out, knocked him down. He looked like he was dead. But after a little bit, he got up. Was he bruised and sore? Oh, yes, he was. But that ceramic plate stopped that bullet. Mainly, the, the bulletproof vests are not bulletproof. They're there to stop the, the shrapnel and everything's like that, the small pieces. But we got to learn how to put the whole armor on, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the, bre the belt of righteousness, the shield of faith, and be strong in the Lord in His mighty powers and stand against the devil. We put on the whole armor. We stand in the day of evil. When is the day of evil? Every single day. Long as the devil is loose on this earth, the Bible says he goes about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says give no place to the devil. There are actually seven pieces to the armor. Now, and I just mentioned it, the helmet of salvation. Now, we're going to be talking a lot more about this because there's so much more spiritually in the Word of God to understand about each one of these individual pieces that it needs to be studied. How many have been in the military? Bunch of you. Bunch of you been in the military. Almost half of who's here today has been in the military. And you had to learn a lot of things, didn't you? Some of them you didn't like, but you had to learn them nonetheless. And you had to learn to do them effectively. You had to learn to take orders. And that was one of the most important things was to learn to take orders. The helmet of salvation. The breastplate of righteousness. I looked at all different kinds of armor that have progressed over the last three, four thousand years. And the Romans took from every one of these armies of the various places around the world. And they learned what was effective and what was not. And the kind of armor that was needed to ultimately and finally be the best armor that gave the best mobility and, and where, the, where the soldier was com still completely flexible to move or to throw or to fight or anything like that, yet still bring protection to that soldier. Loins girt about with truth. This was probably the most important part of the entire uh, armor that the soldier had because everything clipped on to that belt. And if you don't have truth, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says it is the truth that sets you free. And it's truth by which we make it to heaven. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. Then, the shield of faith by which we quench the fiery darts of the enemy. When a soldier is all by himself in the battle, can he easily be defeated by the enemy? Not easily, maybe, but when they surround him and they overwhelm him. But when we've got another person with us, if it's only two people and they're in battle, what do they do? And they're fighting an enemy that's all around. What do two people do when, they're, when they have enemy all around them? What do they do? They stand back to back. So they're backing up each other. And that's what we have to do with each other, ladies and gentlemen. Hallelujah. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now many soldiers, they had this, this short Roman so, sword was highly effective. It was two-sided, two blades, but it came to a real sharp point. They primarily, we see a lot of movies and things of old time reenactments and they're just hacking away, hacking, chopping on each other. That's not what they did. Primarily they used that sword to pierce, to pierce the enemy. And that's exactly what we have to do. Years ago, there was a book written called Piercing the Darkness. Yes. And we want to do that. This, the Bible calls the devil, one of the things of the devil's name is the piercing servant, uh, serpent. The piercing serpent. Our feet shod with the gospel of peace. The lance of praying with all men of prayer and the Holy Spirit for all occasions. Do we need that one? Yes. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. There is seven pieces to the armor. The Bible speaks of how important every person is to the other members of the church. Amen. You're not here by accident. God wants you here. Amen. Because I need you and you need me. You need the leadership and we need you. you if you're a leader and you're going somewhere and you look around, there's nobody behind you. Not, you're not much of a leader. There's nobody there. Well... 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. For as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been made all made to drink into one spirit. Who's that? That's the Holy Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is therefore not, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, and what it's talking about is each one of you, each one of us. So, well, I don't need you. Do you need all the different parts of your body? Oh, yes, you do. You say, well, I'm just a little toe. Well, you ask a person who's lost a little toe and how important a little toe is. A little toe is what helps you stay balanced. And helps you find the furniture. And helps you find furniture. Yeah, well, that does. <laughs> ask my wife about that. <laughs> she can find every piece of furniture in the house <laughs> with her toes. <laughs> If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is therefore not, is it not of the body? Yes, it is. Of course it is. Every part of the body is needed. If the whole body were an eye, where, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where's the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased Him. And if they were all one member, where's the body? But now are there many members, yet one body? Just as we need all the pieces and parts of our body to operate and work the way they're supposed to, so does the church. We need every single one of you to be in your place at the appointed time, whether it's on a Sunday morning, whether it's a Wednesday night, a Tuesday night, a Thursday night, a Friday, whenever it might be where two or more gathered together, the Lord said He's there in the midst. And we have to have that fellowship because God commands it. It's not an option for the church. It's not an option. Every week, 
And many of us have to work at daytime, some work at nighttime, some work here, some work there. The hours are shifting, the hours are changing. Some way, somehow, the Lord tells us to gather together with other believers at least once a week for the nourishment of your spirit being and for the power of God operating in you and with you. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, near, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. In other words, there's parts of our body that we really do take care of, don't we? Oh yeah, we do, because they take care of us. Oh yes. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism or division or break in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Now we got a lot of people absent. And I know the weather and different things like that. But, our, but just like it's happening all over the place, churches are being pulled apart. The devil is trying to, as best he can, to pull the people apart and give you every kind of excuse under the sun to not go to church, not gather together. How many, how many heard that this week? that you didn't need to go to church. <laughs> or you felt, well, I got an excuse, I can't, I don't, I'm not going to go. Well, whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or one member honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now are you the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some of the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? What's the implied answer? No. Are all prophets, are all teachers, all workers of miracles, have all gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Love. Yes. Do we need each other? The Bible says we do, and soldiers of war need each other. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I've loved you, you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. We are commanded by our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ that you are to love me, I'm to love you. You're to love the person sitting next to you. We are family. Amen? Amen. We're family. Now, what is this? What is it? Is it water? Yes, it's water. What's happening to the water? It's got ripples. Over the years, from time to time, and I know it's because I'm pastor, that the Holy Spirit's allowed me to see this. As we worship God from time to time, doesn't happen all the time, I, wish, I, li I wished it would, but it doesn't happen all the time. But every once in a while, the Sh Holy Spirit, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, every time every single one of you walk into this place or come together with another believer, the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit rises. And every once in a while, I get to see it as pastor. And what it looks like just like this air right here. We don't see the air at all. But what I see in the Spirit, I see the ripple of the surface of water. And I can tell you exactly where the anointing is in the room. If it's only down here, then we're not really worshiping God very well. But the more we get into the Spirit, say in the Spirit, the more we get into the Spirit, the more we get into the attitude of worshiping God, then I see the level start coming up. And when it gets up here, even to here, that's when miracles and signs and wonders, that's when people are healed of cancer, that's when diseases are, the power of diseases are broken, that's when Jesus gets glorified. 
When that anointing gets there, and believe me, every single one of you are important because when you're not here, then the level doesn't rise. But when you are here, the level comes up. Your presence in the assembly makes the anointing of the Holy Spirit rise. Because every one of us that named the name of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit, right? It's like the difference between one candle being lit or 50 candles being lit. And the, the more we gather together, the greater the anointing, the greater the light, the greater the power, the greater of everything that God wants to do in the assembly. It's important for you to gather together because your brother and your sister need your presence in the meeting because of what God can do. And He will. Tell me what that is. Now you that are carpenters would know it instantly. Daryl knows. Shush, hush, Daryl. Does anybody else in here know what that is? It's required by law. What is it? Somebody said it. Hurricane. It's a hurricane clip. It's required by law. That's what it does. Why? Because they found out if there was not that connecting little piece of metal with those nails nailed in this piece and that piece to hold them together, during the hurricane, what can happen? The whole roof be tore off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's what you are. That's what you are in the assembly in the church. You are that clip. You are that power and anointing of God by your presence that ministers to every single other person in here. You don't have to speak. You don't have to say anything. That, what does that thing do? It sits there. And it holds. It sits there and it holds. And you say, well, I'm just here today. I'm not doing anything. Oh, yes, you are. That's right. Oh, yes, you are. Everybody else in this room is affected by you being here today. Right. Lift your hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Every one of you are important for what God wants to do just by the seeing of each other and with each other and standing with each other. You are important. God commands us to come together for each other's benefit, not just our own. You are important in the assembly. As soldiers in war need each other, so do we need each other. So Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Yes. And so much the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Yes. Your being here is very, very, very important. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand up. I said this was going to be a short message this morning. I guess that was one of them preacher lies, wasn't it? <laughs> well, 